day, they said, man, you need a haircut, man. So uh, at, at some point, uh, I'm going to get that fresh cut. Uh, but up until then, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna go back to the 70s, ret retroactive and uh, uh, grow my fro. All right. So I got, <laughs> they say, uh, you know, back, back, back in the day, they said you had a, a, a TWA, a teeny weeny afro. So that's what, <laughs> that's what, that's what, hey. <laughs> amen. All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's get into the word of God today. Uh, we actually uh, have come to our last topic uh uh in the area of angels and so uh, as we look at this last uh topic it's you know we're probably going to be uh two weeks uh on this last topic here uh let me see here all right all right so uh as we uh, look at this topic, I uh, wanted to uh, begin and uh, for you to put on your uh, Bible hats. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, we read about a heavenly being who shows up in various forms. Uh, he shows up as a man, as an angel, uh, sometimes as a voice from heaven, and a flame in a burning bush during his appearances he consoles reassures rescues tussles or wrestles with rebukes reproves instructs prophesies and even sometimes destroys or annihilates uh, when he shows up he imparts courage and brings fear in the hearts of those he interacts with in the scripture. Who is this mysterious being who walks across the pages of the Old Testament? He is called the angel of the Lord. And that is the topic that we will be studying today and also next week. Uh, the angel of the Lord. Who, who is this angel of the Lord uh, that we read about in the in the Bible, uh, there's few uh, three views uh, or three main views as to who the angel of the Lord is. Uh, some say he's a special angel. Now, many uh, religious groups, uh, such as the Catholics and Jewish people, uh, they believe him to be one of the highest angels that is sent to represent God. So they say that this angel of the Lord is a very special angel, uh, one of the highest angels uh, that shows up uh, in the pages uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, some people say that uh, the angel of the Lord is a theophany, all right, a theophany. So if you have your notes there, uh, I, I de define what a theophany is. Uh, actually, it comes from two Greek words, uh, theos, which means God, and phino, which means to appear. So a, a theophany is actually an appearance, uh, a visible appearance of God in the realm of mankind. So that uh, anytime that God shows up uh, here on this earth, in the realm of mankind, that's what's known as a theophany. Now, uh, even when you uh, think of theophanies, uh, you know, we know that God is a spirit. So uh, when God shows up, sometimes he will take on a physical form. Now, uh, we, we, we must not get confused and, and think that that's what God looks like when he shows up as a theophany, all right? Uh, because, you know, he is a spirit. And, you know, a spirit is invisible. A spirit is immaterial. So uh, when he shows up as a theophany, uh, you know, we just have to be uh, careful that we don't uh, associate that as the physical form uh, of God, all right? And then there's the uh, final view 
uh, on who the angel of the Lord is. And uh, some people say, and, and this would be the view that I hold. So this, this will be the view that, uh, that, that we will look at as we go through this study, uh, that he is a Christophany. And just like a theophany is an appearance of God, a Christophany, uh, you, yeah, you can guess what that is. Uh, that is an, an appearance of, of Christ. Uh, it comes, again, uh, from two Greek words, Christos, which uh, means Christ or anointed one. You know, so even when we think of the, the name of Jesus Christ, that uh, that was not his name, <laughs> right? Uh, Christ was not his name. Christ was his title. His name was Jesus. And his title was Christos, the anointed one, the uh, Messiah. Okay. So uh, I, I always, whenever I teach this, I always like to bring that point out that his name was not Jesus Christ. All right. His name was Jesus and his title was Christ, the anointed one. All right. That's the, the word Christos. Uh, again, that means anointed. Uh, so Christos uh, uh, and then uh, final which means to appear. So what is a Christophany? A Christophany is a pre-incarnate. Now, when we say pre-incarnate, what do we mean? That means uh, before he showed up uh, in the manger. Uh, we just finished celebrating Christmas. Now, again, we know that Jesus uh, was not born uh, on December 25th. You know, we know that for a fact. As a matter of fact, he probably, uh, many believe that he was either born in the spring or the fall of the year. Uh, the fact that shepherds were out in the fields and they wouldn't have been out there, you know, in, uh, according to many now in the wintertime. Uh, so uh, he, the pre-incarnate appearance, appearance, that means that he actually appeared before he showed up in Bethlehem's manger. And uh, when we look at the Old Testament, we see many appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. So he was around, you know, a lot of people uh, think that, well, when Jesus was born, that's when he came into existence. No, uh, Jesus was uh, in existence uh, from eternity past. Uh, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, Jesus was the word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus has always been around. Uh, you know, he didn't just show up at Bethlehem. Uh, you know, and uh, evidence of the fact that he's always been around, uh, we see in the Old Testament, uh, these appearances of Christ, again, they are called Christophanies, all right? So th these are uh, three views uh, regarding the angel of the Lord and, and who the angel of the Lord is. Uh, some people believe a special angel, others believe a theophany, appearance of God, and then and when we say God, you know, we, you know, uh, probably uh, referencing God the Father, uh, and then uh, a Christophany, which is an appearance of, uh, of Christ. All right. Now, uh, let's establish one thing uh, as we look at the angel of the Lord. And so we're going to spend uh, our time uh, today uh, in our study uh, looking at this, and that is the fact that the angel of the Lord is God. The angel of the Lord is God. So we, you know, we, we have to establish that. So, you know, now uh, it, it comes to the fact whether he is a theophany or Christophany, right? But the angel of the Lord is God. Now, next week, I'm going to spend the whole lesson on telling you why the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Now, again, a lot of people don't believe that, but I'm going to bring uh, evidence uh, from the scripture to show you that the angel of the Lord is, is Jesus Christ. But today, uh, we want to spend our time establishing the fact that the angel of the Lord is God, okay? He's not uh, some uh, angel. He's not Michael or Gabriel. Uh, he's not a special angel, but the angel of the Lord is God. And we're going to show you that from the scripture today. All right. Uh, first of all, we see that Hagar recognized him as God. That when the angel of the Lord uh, shows up in uh, Genesis uh, 16, 
that he is God, right? Uh, now let's let's rehearse the story. Go back over the story. Uh, you remember Sarah, uh, and that was her name before what? Before God changed it. And what did God change her name to? He changed it to uh, Sarah, which means uh, mother of uh, of many. Uh, and then uh, Abram, uh, his name before he, it was called Abraham, uh, his name meant father. And then when it, they changed his name to Abraham, that meant father of many. So Sarah and Abram uh, could not have a child. And so Sarah gave uh, Hagar the, her handmaid to Abraham uh, so that she could conceive a child. Uh, after the child was uh, conceived and born, uh, there arose a conflict between Sarah and Hagar. And as a result of this, uh, Hagar had to flee into the wilderness, all right? And, you know, she felt alone. She felt abandoned. And when she was in the wilderness, uh, notice this. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and assured her it was all right to return uh, and submit to Sarah. So who shows up while she's out there uh, grieving in the wilderness? The angel of the Lord uh, shows up while she's out there. Now, she has a conversation with this angel. And when the conversation concluded, notice what she says. Uh, she called the one she spoke with Yahweh El Roy, which means the God who sees me. So let's go back. Let's go back. Who did she, who appeared to her? The angel of the Lord appeared to her, right? When she gets finished, she says that the one she spoke with was Yahweh El Roy, the Lord, the God who sees me. So Hagar saw El Roy, the one who sees and knows every circumstance a person goes through. So this angel of the Lord that shows up is God. So there's no there's no question uh, about that. And you know, as even as we first, I, I don't know if you remember, we did I did a whole study on the uh, on the names of God. Uh, we talked about the Yahweh names of God, and we talked about the L names of God. All right, and we went down through uh, each group. Uh, so if you want that uh, study, uh, let me know. I can uh, send you the notes from that or the PowerPoints from that study. Uh, but uh, we see here that uh, Hagar is interacting with God, the God who sees and knows every circumstance a person uh, goes through. Uh, so uh, so just, just think about that. that here she thought she was all alone, you know, uh, out there. Uh, she had been cast off by Abraham and, and Sarah. And now she feels, you know, like she doesn't have a friend in the world as she is out here in the desert. And all of a sudden the angel of the Lord shows up and, and ministers to her. And so this lets us know that no matter what we're going through, that uh, there's a God who sees and knows every circumstance a person uh, is going through. You know, I, I think of uh, a couple of months ago, I, I shared with the congregation uh, that, you know, I was having uh, some back problems and uh, these back problems uh, and praise God that it's gotten a whole lot better uh, now. So I thank God for his, uh, for his healing. Um, but you know, these back problems kept me up and I would wake up in the middle of the night you know, and, and just, you know, not being able to sleep in pain. And uh, it's good to know that Yahweh El Roy was present, right? The Lord God who sees, he sees and knows every circumstance a person is going through, that you're never alone, that you're not by yourself. 
you may feel like you're by yourself. You know, you wake up in the middle of the night and hurting, can't go back to sleep. And uh, you might say, man, you know, um, it's, this is pretty lonely here in the, in the middle of the night. But no, there is a God that is right there. There is a God who sees exactly what you're going through. There is a God who knows the circumstances of what you're going through. There is a God who even can pinpoint the problem of what's happening in your body. And, and so uh, we, we need to be like Hagar sometimes. You know, we need, when we feel like we're by ourselves and we feel like we're all alone, uh, we need to realize that uh, El, Yahweh El Roy is there. Now notice, and I, I, I don't have time to get into this this afternoon, but notice the compound words that's used, Yahweh, all right? And, and, and that has a special name all by itself, Yahweh, and then El Roy. So, you know, uh, God showed up uh, to be what uh, Hagar needed on uh, this particular occasion. Uh, he identified himself to Abraham as God. And, you know, we all know the, uh, the story where God told Abraham to go up to Mount Moriah and offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And uh, God told Abraham to do this uh, to show that he feared God. Now, you know, I, I was thinking, uh, you know, there, 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 there seems to me there could be another way that uh, God <laughs> could have got Abraham or told Abraham uh, uh, to do something to show that he re respected God, he revered God, he feared God. But this is what God told him uh, to do. So it was God who told Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice. And it was God, if, uh, if we look in Genesis uh, chapter 22 and verse 11, listen to this, listen to this. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So who spoke to Abraham? It was the angel of the Lord. And uh, he says in verse 11, uh, lay not uh, thy hand. I mean, excuse me, verse 12. Uh, lay not thy hand upon the lad neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. So again, in verse 11, it says that the angel of the Lord spoke to uh, Abraham. And now watch this, watch this, all right? In verse 14, and Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen. So what did Abraham call the place? He, he called the, the name of the place Yahweh uh, Jireh. And that actually means uh, the name comes from two Hebrew words, Yahweh, which means Lord and Yahweh to see, and it means the Lord uh, will provide. The Lord, he sees and he will provide. So who did Abraham recognize uh, God as in Genesis chapter 22? It was the angel of the Lord. Now, again, next week, I'm going to spend a whole lesson just dealing with the fact that Jesus Christ in many of these situations was the angel of the Lord. So who was it that appeared to Abraham? It was Jesus Christ uh, that appeared to Abraham. And uh, he, he appeared to Abraham in the form of the angel of the Lord. Now, when you think about the fact that it says uh, his name is Yahweh uh, Jireh, the Lord will provide. You know, what does God provide? Well, you know, for Abraham, he provided 
uh, a substitute, a ram in the bush for uh, his son, Isaac. Now, keep in mind that, let me go back here. Uh, keep in mind that Isaac uh, was no little, little child. You know, Isaac was not some uh, four or five year old little boy. Uh, Isaac was, was probably a teenager at least. And many believe that he might've even been a young man. Uh, and, and so Abraham uh, goes to offer up his son, Isaac, uh, on the altar to offer him up uh, to God. And uh, God provided, God provided a ram in the bush. Now, uh, many people uh, believe that Abraham understood two things. And that's why he was willing to trust God and offer up his son is that Abraham uh, believed that uh, either God was going to provide a sacrifice, which is what God did. Or uh, if we read Hebrews 11, uh, it says that, uh, that he believed that God was going to raise him up from the dead. Uh, Hebrews 11 talks about that. So either way, uh, Abraham uh, when he went up into the mountain, Mount Moriah, to offer up Isaac, he believed that he was coming down. Him and Isaac were coming down together. Because even if, as you read the text in Genesis, uh, in, in the Hebrew, it says, me and the lad will go up on the mountain. Me and the lad will worship God. And me and the lad will come back down. So Abraham believed that he was coming back down uh, off of that mountain. Uh, with Isaac. And so that meant one of two things. Either God was going to provide a ram in the bush, or like the writer of Hebrews says, that he believed that God was going to raise him up even from the dead. Uh, regardless of the fact is that God provided. God provided. And, and, and that was a name that Abraham gave to God. Yahweh Jireh, the Lord will provide. Now, when you think about, uh, you know, what is it <clears throat> that God provides? I like Philippians 4, 19. But my God, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So this angel of the Lord that shows up was named Yahweh Jireh. God will provide. And so we even see that as we come into the new testament that god is a provider that god will provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory that uh whatever we need uh god will supply it and and notice where he supplies from <clears throat> he supplies from his infinite storehouse that just talked to the widow in the day of the elijah when uh, they had the oil in the meal and how it didn't run out, right? God has an infinite uh, storehouse. Just uh, talk to the little lamb that had the uh, fish uh, in the bread and how that they fed the multitude that day and it didn't run out. That God provides from his infinite, <coughs> from his infinite storehouse. So we thank God for that. We thank God. And, and, and so let me ask you the question, my brother and my sister, have you experienced the provision of God and that he's able to give you uh, whatever you need? Man, I tell you what, I, I, I can, my wife and I, uh, we can give you testimony after testimony after testimony, how God has provided uh, for us. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, and, and oftentimes, you know, we try to rehearse that in front of our kids and our grandkids to let them know uh, how God has provided for us. So uh, hopefully after we have left here and gone to glory, that the way that God has provided for us will continue to be passed down through generations, that uh, uh, our kids uh, will pass it down. Uh, we're able to share with our grandkids uh, and hopefully they share with their kids uh, how that God provided for uh, 
uh, Pastor and Angie Glaze. Do you know him in this way today? Do you, do you know him as Yahweh Jireh, <clears throat> the God who provides? All right. And, and, and we see that uh, the angel of the Lord, he was revealed to Moses as God. He was revealed to Moses as God. As, as Moses watched his father-in-law's flocks in the desert, the angel, of, <laughs> so who shows up, all right? Who shows up? The angel of the Lord appeared to him in the midst of a burn, burning bush, all right? And so Moses goes to check out this uh, burning bush. And when he goes, he got to the bush and it says that God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, here the angel of the Lord identified himself as God. The angel of the Lord revealed himself to Moses as God. As Moses said unto God, and, and so God and Moses have this conversation, right, at the burning bush. And, and God tells Moses that I've called you to go down into Egypt and to deliver my people uh, out of the Egyptian bondage. And, and so Moses said to God, yeah, when, when I come, now who, who is he talking to? All right, let's, let's go back and get that context. He's talking to the angel of the Lord, right? He's talking to the angel of the Lord. Uh, behold, uh, when I come to the children of Israel and say unto them, the God of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they say unto me, what is his name? Uh, what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. He said, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, uh, I am hath sent you so now next week i'm gonna get into this in a little bit uh a little bit more as we relate to jesus christ as i try to prove my point that jesus christ is the angel of the lord because you remember in john chapter 8 when jesus got in dialogue with the pharisees and and they began to uh uh, uh approach him and and come in on him uh jesus backed them off and uh he said, because uh, they were talking about, well, Abraham is our father. You know, they were bragging about that. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And so what was Jesus saying? Jesus saying that he was the one that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. That he was the angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. So it's very interesting. Uh, the word, the, the phrase, I am. <clears throat> God used this, uh, used this of himself when he was speaking to Moses. Again, when Moses asked him, you know, uh, who should I say sent me? He said, I am. Tell him that I am sent me. And I am, uh, in essence, God was saying, I am who I am. I will be what I what I will be. This statement, uh, this is a statement of God's self-existence, right? His self-existence. I am. He is not dependent on anything else. He is not dependent on anyone else. That God has everything that he needs within himself to exist. Now, you don't have everything within yourself to exist. That the Bible says, in him, we live and move and have our being. That means that we exist in him. The old song used to say, Lord, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, whither shall I go? Whither shall I go? See, we are totally dependent on God. Now, there's a lot of people that think 
that they are dependent on their self, right? Uh, some people say, well, I'm a self-made man or I'm a self-made woman. Uh, some people say, well, you know, God didn't get me up this morning. The alarm clock got me up, as I always say, right? Take that alarm clock down to the cemetery and let it go off and see how many people get up, right? It was God that woke us up, God that provides for us. It's in him that we, we live and move and have our being, that without him, we're nothing. Without him, we're lost. But he, and see, that you know, in, in order, there has to be, and see, here's where the evolutionists get in the prop, get into trouble at, right? Because you know, they they believe that everything uh came out of nothing, right? That's what they want to tell you. That's what they want you to believe. And that's what a lot of leaders in our country, you know, government people, uh Hollywood people, you know, they all have uh, swallowed the evolutionary lie. And so they they believe that. Uh, we came from nothing, right? But it, there has to be one who is self-existent, who exists outside of everything else. There has to be. You know, saints, <laughs> let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. Sit down and put a plate in front of you. And sit there for a week, two weeks, a month, a year, two years, five years, and wait for something to appear in that plate, right? Now, there might be something that appeared in the plate because of the environment that we live in. It might be, you know, some mold that shows up, right? But the, the, the mold is, is not coming out of nowhere. The mold is coming out of the air, right? So who put the air here? All right. So, but the analogy that I'm trying to make is that if you put that plate uh, before you, other than, like I said, if some mold showed up, which would, which actually the mold is not self-created because it's coming out of the air, you know, that, that, that's around us. But you put that plate there and you, you, you sit there all your life <clears throat> and nothing is going to show up on that plate. Why? Because you can't get something out of nothing. It's impossible to get something out of nothing. But yet and still, that's what people are telling us and they want us to believe, that you can get something out of nothing. It's impossible. There has to be a first cause, which is God, which is the, 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 the creator of all other causes. So there has to be something that is self-existent, something that needs nothing else to survive, and that is God. And so that's why God says, when Moses said, who shall I say sent, sent me, that God says, tell him I am. I am the self-existent one. I am the one that exists outside of all other things. I am. And so again, <clears throat> when we look to next week, when we're talking about Jesus being the angel of the Lord, who did Jesus say he was? He said, I am. And then Jesus not only said, I am, but he even went on to tag some descriptions onto that. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. So Jesus went on to tag on descriptions onto that, that word, I am. But so who was it that appeared to Moses? in the burning bush. It was the Lord. Uh, it was the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord was I am. Now, you know, what, what, what are the implications when uh, God says I am? What does that mean? That means he's the God who never changes, right? The same yesterday, today, or forever. When God says I am, that means that I don't change, right? Uh, when God says I am, that means he's beyond all comprehension. That, you know, somebody... <laughs> Somebody said, said to me one time, well, you know what? Uh, I just have a hard time with God uh, <clears throat> because, you know, I can't understand him or I can't comprehend him. Now, raise your hand. No, you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, how many people want a God that they can totally understand? 
How many people want a God that they can comprehend? You know, Isaiah said his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. So if I, if I got a God that I can comprehend, then that means that I'm God. So I don't want that. So when God says I am, that means that he's beyond all comprehension, that, you know, no one can comprehend, comprehend him. And when he says I am, that means that he's a God of, of all sufficiency that uh, he, he is able to provide uh, whatever uh, we need. So th there's some powerful implications when this angel of the Lord says, I am, you know, again, so what, you know, what's the, what's the point, point that we're trying to establish that the angel of the Lord is God. Now there are other times that, you know, we, and, and maybe I'll bring some of those out next week uh, where uh, an, a, a regular angel is called the angel of the Lord. Right there, are, there are certain situations where a, a, a regular angel is called uh, an angel of the Lord, and he's sometimes even the angel of the Lord. But saints, again, this is where good hermeneutics comes in, because you always have to look at context, 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 and that tells you uh, who it is. So uh, the the implications that the angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses and said, I am, you know, that meant that he was God, that, that he was God. And so, you know, that's why, you know, some people say Jesus never said that he was God. Well, he did when he said, I am, that's exactly. And that's why the Pharisees got upset with him because they knew what he was saying when he said, I am. All right. So uh, again, uh, strong implications behind this phrase, I am. Now, let me let me just uh, go into this for a second. Uh, what we have here is known as the tetragrammaton, right? And so when God said to Moses, when Moses said, well, who should I say sent me? Uh, and God said, I am. You see that Hebrew word right there? That's what God said. That was, that was the exact word that God said. That's Hebrew. I am, all right? And actually, uh, the word is uh, pronounced Yahweh, uh, yod Hey vah Hey. Those are uh, four consonants in the Hebrew language. And so when, when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? God said this word right here, right? The, the very word that you're looking at, that's exactly what God said, uh, Yahweh. Who shall I say sent me? Yahweh sent you. I am sent you. See, Yahweh and I am are interchangeable. You know, I am is the way that we say it in English. Yahweh is the way it's said in Hebrew. All right. Uh, let me let me go here and 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 do this. Uh, so that that name that I just gave you, Yahweh. Jewish people would, would not even pronounce it. It was so holy that that name was Yahweh. It was so holy that uh, they would substitute the name Adonai. They would not pronounce the name Yahweh. So when God said, when, uh, tell them that Yahweh sent you. Tell them that I am sent you, right? So a Jewish person wouldn't even say that. You know, they would substitute the word uh, Adonai for the word Yahweh, you know, and uh, you, you, some of you may remember when we've had uh, rabbis come to Bethany and do the Seder or do other things, then they'll close out with the uh, Levitical blessing, you know, where it says the Lord bless you and keep you. That's what we say. But if you really listen to them, those Jewish rabbis, they don't say Yahweh. I mean, they, they, yeah, they don't say Yahweh. They say Adonai. So next time you hear uh, a Jewish rabbi give the ironic benediction, right? The Lord bless thee, keep thee. The Lord uh, make his face shine upon thee. The Lord give you peace. Right? Next time you hear them say that, uh, you will not hear. It's actually the word Yahweh, but they will not pronounce the word Yahweh. They will say the word Adonai, all right? And, and even when Jewish scribes, would translate the Bible, uh, 
uh, or, or rewrite scripture uh, before they would even write that name, uh, they would wash their whole body. They would take a bath before because that name was that sacred. All right. So what am I saying? I, I'm saying all that to say this, that the angel of the Lord is God, right? I am. He's the one. That's that's God. Well, you know, what, what is the reason for them not pronouncing it? It was too sacred to pronounce. There is no infinite word that can identify an infinite God. And then some of them were fearful of arousing the wrath of God. And so that's why uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't even say uh, the name. Uh, let me back up here. Uh, so. Uh, when God gave Moses his name. Do you know it's it's a special privilege back in the ancient day to know a person's name? That in the ancient world, if if you knew another person's name, that was a special privilege, and it was only offered to uh, certain persons. All right, and and so look at this: that God favored His people by le by letting them know what His name. That God said, look, I have a special relationship with you. And so I'm going to open up <clears throat> and I'm going to let you know my name, right? And so the fact that God did this for Moses and God did this for the, the Hebrew people, it was letting them know that we have a special relationship. That, that it's a special privilege for you to know my name. And what, is, what, what was that name? That name was Yahweh, that four letter consonant, all right? And, and, and so uh, I'm gonna finish with this right here. God's name reveals his character. God's name signifies his character. So that when Moses requested uh, to know God's name, what Moses, what, what's your character? What can, <laughs> in other words, what can you do, right? That that whenever I go and, and tell the people uh, that uh, that I, I'm, I'm, I've been sent here to deliver them, you know, who should I say sent me? You know, what is your character that I should tell them? And God says, I am, you know, and what does that mean? I can do anything. I'm the self-existent one. I exist without anything. Uh, I don't need anything to exist. And, and so again, when Moses asked God, by what name should he make him known to the Israelites? In essence, he was asking, by what character will you reveal yourself? And re how will you relate uh, to, your, to your people? All right. And, uh, and, and so again, the idea here that we've been talking about is that the angel, and I, and, and I want you to get this, that the angel of the Lord is God. That the angel of the Lord is God. So we've established that fact this week. And so next week, I'm gonna show you from the scripture that the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ. All right, so let me uh, stop sharing and see if uh, we have any comments or questions. Uh, as we come back together. Uh, 